We saw in the last video that manual allocation, which in C++ would be the new and delete operators, gives us a lot of power over the lifespan of objects. We can now create objects and control exactly when they are destroyed or in which order they are destroyed. And it also allows us to escape from all the constraints imposed by scoped allocation. Because when you allocate things as local variables in a scope, the order of destruction is dictated by when the scope ends and also when the variables were created inside the scope by the law of socks and shoes. Uh, and I mentioned in the previous video, it's great to have all this power, but of course with power comes responsibility. And that's one reason why if scoped allocation is good enough, you should just use it. You shouldn't try and use new and delete unless you need something that you're not getting already with scoped allocation. Uh, and, of course, by using the new operator, you are taking complete responsibility for the lifespan of the object that you are creating. And that means it is your responsibility as the programmer, once you have used the new operator, to ensure that eventually the object you're creating gets deleted. Uh, and so I want to talk about what happens if you don't. I want to talk about when that can happen, but also, first, the implications of it. Um, and broadly, they are what are called memory leaks. This is a concept that you likely remember from CSC 111. It came up at basically the same time as now, but in that course, when we talked about manual allocation. And the idea is I would use a function like malloc in C to allocate myself some kind of um, storage for something whose lifespan I wanted to be indeterminate. So for example, a node of a linked list. I'm allocating one inside of a function, but I wanted to outlive the function. I'd use malloc to give me the node object, and then I would get back a pointer to it. And I might make other pointers to it over time, but each pointer would be scoped somewhere and it would get destroyed. And eventually, at some point in the future, the very last pointer to the node object would get destroyed. If I have not manually freed the memory, so in C you use the free function for it, in C++ you use the delete operator, if I have not destroyed the object myself and I forget where it is, if I lose the very last pointer to it, then it's lost forever. The object is really still there. It's sort of floating around as wreckage. Um, and because it's still there, because you never said that you were done with it, the space can't be reclaimed for other use. Nobody else can be given the memory that's being used up by this object. But there's sort of a paradox because n you can never recycle the object. Nobody else can get the memory because the object still exists, but you can't return the object for recycling because you don't know where it is. It's lost. It's a leak. You've taken the book out of the library and not returned it. And as I said, in, in, I imagine the analogy that I gave in 111 was, um, if I take a book out of the library and I don't return it, then nobody else can read the book. If I keep taking books out of the library and I don't return any of them, or I throw them in the ocean or something, eventually the library is going to run out of books, and then the library is going to have to close, and then I'm going to be sad. And it's not just me that's going to be sad, it's everybody that wants to use the library. So if I keep using this shared resource, memory, if I keep asking for more and more memory and I don't return it, well, at minimum, I'm going to get to a point where my program can't continue because it can't keep asking for memory when there isn't any left. Um, but it'll actually affect all of the other programs running on the computer as well. It's a big deal. Um, the issue, though, is that in C++, I would argue it's actually a bigger deal. The same problem happens in C++. Um, if I use the new operator to allocate an object, we won't use type node. We'll use type fruit because that's what we have in this file. We won't worry about type node yet. Um, I allocate an object of type fruit, and I use the new operator, so I get back a pointer to the object. Okay, there it is. And then later, for some reason, I forget where the object is. Well, now that I've forgotten where it is, if I no longer have a pointer to it, I can never delete it. That means that the object will float around as wreckage for all eternity. So the memory can never be reclaimed. Nobody else can ever use that memory. And if I keep doing that, the program is going to run out of memory. Okay, fair enough. That's the problem we had in C as well. But the difference in C++ is that in C++, the object I created has an identity beyond just being a bunch of data. In C, the variables we work with, or structures or whatever, are just data, buckets of data. In C++, we've got these smart objects, these classes that we've defined. And we've just spent a couple of weeks talking about the laws of the universe for these objects. For example, if I define a class that has any constructors, I can assume that when an object of this type is created, a constructor must always be called. Or, if you like, every class always has constructors, but if you don't provide one yourself, the compiler provides one for you. And in any case, a constructor must always be called. Similarly, if you provide a destructor, the destructor must always be called when the object is destroyed. Notice that I didn't say if. 
not if the object is destroyed, when the object is destroyed. Construction, use, destruction are all critical parts of every object's lifespan. Every object gets constructed, I guess it gets used, and then it gets destroyed. That means if you have a destructor, it must always be called at some point. And the issue here is that if I allocate an object with the new operator, and I forget to delete it, well, we know that the object gets destroyed, the destructor gets called when you call delete, when you use the delete operator. If you don't do that, if you neglect your duty to shepherd the object through its entire lifespan, if you don't use the delete operator, then the object never gets destroyed, its destructor never gets called. It misses out on that part of its lifespan. And that's a really big deal, because although we've been writing pretty trivial destructors so far, because we're doing this to demonstrate a concept, a lot of objects that have a destructor do so because there is important work to be done. There's, there are loose ends to tie up. Think of, for, an ex for example, an object that is working with some kind of uh, shared resource, like a file on disk or a database or something. When the destructor for that object is reached, the object knows it's about to be destroyed, maybe that's where it finalizes details, like writing the file back to disk, or finalizing the database and writing it out permanently so it can be used again later. If the destructor gets skipped, maybe the database or the file ends up in an inconsistent state. Not only does the object get broken, but the database that you might want to use later gets corrupted or something. So it's really important if a destructor exists that it gets called, because that's one of our laws of the universe. That's part of an object natural lifespan, something that we have no right to deny it. And so that's one of the reasons memory leaks are a really big deal. If you choose to use manual allocation, you need to make sure every single object always gets deallocated explicitly via the use of the delete operator. Okay, so you hear that sermon, and I'm sure you're like, okay, fine, whatever, I'll just call the delete operator, give me a br And I get it, I mean, I understand that obviously, yeah, it seems like if you have the new operator, just use the delete operator, that'll fix the problem. But what's weird is that memory leaks are actually pretty complicated. And as programs get bigger and bigger, and they've done studies on this, as programs get bigger and bigger, if you're doing everything manually, so if you're doing manual allocation and deallocation in all cases, and the program gets bigger and bigger and has more and more moving parts, memory leaks are pretty much inevitable. There are ways of finding them, so there are tools you can use to diagnose them, but they are going to happen. The solution is either to never use manual allocation, which isn't really an option in many programs, or to bring in some outside help. There are libraries you can get that do memory management for you. They programmatically keep track of where everything is to make sure nothing can ever get lost at C. We are going to spend very little time in this course on new and delete. We're going to spend the next few videos on it and then pivot to an example of one of those memory management strategies, a very simple one called a smart pointer, which is a type of pointer that can help you remember whether... so. Recall that in that example where we had a memory leak, I had multiple pointers to an object, and I slowly lost them one by one. And by the time I got to the last one, maybe I didn't know that this is the very last pointer I have to my object, and so I don't feel bad about letting it go. But then it turns out I have a memory leak. If I use a smart pointer, the smart pointer can remember whether it's the last thing that you have pointing to an object and make sure the object always gets deleted. And we're going to come to that later this week. But first, we have to understand the problem. And so, although it's true that, yes, there are a lot of memory leaks that you can avoid, that are obvious that you can avoid, there are lots of strange ways memory leaks can creep into your program without you noticing. A lot of very subtle ways a memory leak can occur. And I'm going to show off examples of both types, the obvious kind and the less obvious kind. Although the one I'm going to show off that's less obvious is still a bit on the obvious side. There are far less um, obvious memory leaks than this. Uh, okay, so I've got this um, function called make fruit and it allocates two objects of type fruit. Um, and it, the pointers are called the fruit and another fruit, and then it returns the pointer called the fruit. The way I would interpret this is that it's creating an object with the name raspberry inside of it. Uh, and of course, by using the new operator, the object has been manually allocated, dynamically allocated in no particular scope. So the object will live until somebody calls delete. Um, by returning the pointer to that object, I would argue that that's telling the caller of the function that they are now responsible for the welfare of the object. They now take custody of that object, which means the caller of the function gets this object and has to somehow call delete on it later in the program. The issue is on line 29, I'm creating another object of type fruit. 
and then the pointer to that object vanishes when the function ends. Nobody else ever sees that object but me, and the function then ends. And that means the object is lost, which means I have a memory leak. And again, a memory leak is already a problem in C, but not only is it leaked, but the object that I'm referring to doesn't get destroyed, doesn't get to experience its full natural lifespan. And although, I mean, Whatever I might say about pineapples, even I think that a pineapple and any other object in the program deserves to live out its full, wholesome, natural lifespan. And so here we have a sort of obvious memory leak. I'm going to scroll down to main and then run the program. So in main, here's what I'm doing. I allocate a fruit object like we did in the previous video. It's going to have the name pear. I have the second pointer set to the return value of make fruit. So somewhere between lines 46 and 48, so between main two and main three, uh, the, the lines of output, we should see the constructor being called for both raspberry and pineapple. Um, okay, and then go down here, I delete the object with the name pair, showing off that I'm allowed to delete things whenever I want. I then call this second function that converts a string to an integer, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And then down here, I delete the object with the name raspberry, the thing that came back from my function. So we'll run that. And we'll just count constructor and destructor calls. Um, this, is, this warning is actually the compiler sort of catching on to the memory leak that I've created for myself here. Okay, so um, we construct pear, we construct raspberry, we construct pineapple, we then destruct pear. In the meantime, we construct and destruct strawberry. That's actually happening here. So we can see the convert to int function constructs an object with the name strawberry, does something, then destroys the object, it deletes it. So in, in the meantime, between main three and main four, we construct and destruct the strawberry object, but that, that nets to zero. And then at the bottom, I destruct raspberry. Notice that nowhere do I call the destructor for pineapple. That object did not get to live out its full natural life. Instead, it got frozen in stasis at some point, and it still exists at the end of time. It never gets to experience the full lifespan that every object deserves. That is a big problem. So it's a memory leak. Ultimately, the problem is that it's a memory leak. Um, the issue here, though, is that I would argue that beyond simply wasting memory, this program is invalid. This program does not obey the laws of the universe. We've seen before that a program compiling doesn't make it valid. There's plenty of programs we can write that are not valid despite the fact that the compiler accepts them. One simple example would be if I create a vector, so I'll just sort of make a mock-up of that. If I have a vector of ints and then I try to index it in a way that I'm not allowed to, that's undefined behavior, but the compiler will probably let me get away with that. It doesn't, make the, it doesn't mean that the program is correct. This program is invalid, and the program where I'm not deallocating pineapple is also invalid. It is an invalid program because it is not obeying all of the invariants that we expect. For example, that a destructor will always be called, and the reason that's happening is because of my irresponsibility. I am the programmer that used the new operator. I should be the one making sure that it gets deleted. It's not the compiler's fault or the language's fault that that happened. Uh, and it's especially not the implementer of the fruit class's fault that I misused allocation. Okay, great. But you would look at that and say, but of course, that's a memory leak. It's obvious. I'll just not do that. I'm not going to write something so obviously wrong, Bill. Fair enough. I actually believe you. Obviously, if you're at this point in the course, well, I mean, even at the beginning of a course like this, I wouldn't expect you to do something like that. You can catch a problem like that and fix it. Fair enough. Everybody makes mistakes, but that's one of those things we could debug. The issue is memory leaks can show up in a lot of other places where it's not as obvious. Um, so I have this function here called convert to int. And you can see in main, I try to convert the string 6 to the int 6, and it works. x is 6. What if I do this? So I'm now going to create a variable called y, resulting from converting a string that is not a number. And we know already, if we give a function uh, an input that it can't work with, there is a way, there is a strategy that exists for handling that. So it would be throwing an exception. If the function can't handle its input, it throws an exception. And so we shouldn't be surprised if, when I run the program now, after uncommenting the line, that it throws an exception. And I want to make two points here. Um, okay, wait, first I want to save the code. Um, then I want to compile, so it's sort of anticlimactic. Okay, there we go. So we can see again the compiler is sort of noticing what I'm doing is a bit contrived here. Um, and we notice here what's happening is we're, after I construct, um, so after x equals 6, after this line, we see some stuff happening and then the program just aborts. The program ends prematurely. Um, in this case, the program is also invalid. Letting an exception escape from main is invalid. It might be the case that memory leaks are happening here, but I would actually argue that in cases where the program is invalid for some other reason, it's not the memory leak's fault. So for example, a strong Strawberry has just been constructed and never gets destructed. And similarly, the raspberry up here never got destructed. 
But you could make, I think, a very convincing argument that, well, of course it didn't. The program is broken. It, it just ended halfway through because you didn't catch an exception. Um, and to be clear, what's really happening there is the convert to int function creates a fruit object for no particular reason. It then calls s2i, which we already know will throw an exception if the string is invalid, the string is not an int, and then it returns after, it first deletes the fruit and then returns the value that comes back from s2i, which is why here we notice it constructs a strawberry, then it deletes the strawberry, then it returns the value 6. Um, and so you could argue that because the exception escaped all the way to main, of course the program's broken. And it's not because of memory leaks, it's because I didn't write a, a pro the program properly, I'm not handling my errors. Okay, fair enough, I'll call your bluff. Let's use a try block to catch the exception. Uh, and so I'm not going to bother doing anything with y because we know there's going to be an exception here. So I'll catch uh, the invalid argument exception that comes back. Um, there we go. And I know, of as we know from earlier in the course, when I've caught the exception, I can then handle the error gracefully and everything is fine. So I'll, I'll print out um, caught an invalid argument exception. Uh, and then everything's fine, just in case you didn't already believe that. Um, I certainly don't believe that if I'm writing it. Uh, okay, so I'll print that out, and great, I, I'm now catching the exception. Main can now take charge. This raspberry that we constructed earlier will get destructed, will get destroyed properly when I get to line 66, because the catch block means the program doesn't just abort, doesn't end prematurely. So we'll try that. Uh, and the compiler's warning there, uh, we can still ignore that, it's not germane to this. Uh, I'm not printing out why, because why can never be used, because we know they're going to get an exception there. And we can see, okay, so we construct Raspberry. We get down here, we get that exception, everything's fine, we destroy Raspberry. Fair enough. The program was able to, um, I guess, regain its footing. So, like, we were able to, to right the ship. But there's another problem, which is that, um, notice that I constructed a strawberry there, and then an exception got thrown. Where does that strawberry get destroyed? And if we scroll up, now, I'll acknowledge that this function looks a little bit contrived, but I think it is a pretty standard example of a design pattern that you might have used. You do some work, you do some more work, and then you go back to the work you started with. So I create a fruit, I then call s2i, then I delete the fruit. I mean, a bit contrived, but you've probably written functions that are 50 lines long that have a lot of interleaved work. The issue here is an exception occurred during this and just flew right over your head. The exception occurred in s2i, got thrown back out of this function, and by the time we, we were able to write the ship, the function was long gone. That means that the memory leak happened by accident. You did everything you thought you were supposed to do. You thought that you were meeting your obligation to delete the object, but something intervened. And we know already C++ has a lot of different ways that control flow can take um, dramatic swerves in the middle of a program. Exceptions, I think, are a, a very dramatic example of that. And think about this. If you're writing code with manual allocation, can you really be assured that between allocating something and later when you deallocate it that nothing unexpected happens? Because if it does, then you might end up losing the uh, pointer, the last pointer to your object, and leaking memory. That's why it's such a big deal. It is definitely possible to catch obvious memory leaks like this. Um, but when you have lots of pointers to objects flying around your program and lots of parts of the program holding on to pointers, not only is there that problem of not knowing whether the pointer you have is the last one, but even when you do, I mean, inside of this function, it's obvious f is the very last pointer to this object. Even if you do, you might lose control. And if you do, you get a memory leak. And if a memory leak happens, your program is invalid. So these are all very good reasons that we should be very, very careful about using new and delete. We should understand that they are very volatile operators. We need them because everything we use um, to get around them does use them in secret. So for example, we've been avoiding having to use manual allocation by using things like vectors all semester. Vectors are some magical array-like thing that can grow and shrink. Well, spoiler alert, deep down vectors use new and delete. And what I'm trying to get at here is that although those operators are important, it's good to have low-level features like this, we should avoid them unless absolutely necessary. If at all possible, we shouldn't use new and delete. We should use something that wraps around new and delete with a very carefully designed set of protections to prevent memory leaks. Now, one of those things, as I just mentioned, is the vector. We've been using a vector all semester as an easy way of storing a bunch of stuff, understanding that due to the abstraction and encapsulation that we've grown so used to by now, the vector takes care of its own business. We can assume the vector works properly and doesn't have any surprises because it's well written. But ultimately, underneath, it's working with these volatile features like new and delete. I'm going to prove that point in the next few videos by writing a vector. We now know enough about um, manual allocation and classes and operators that we can now write a vector and we can see what all that magic has been all this time.